<laughs> in the middle of this journey we call life, I got lost in a dark wood. So said Dante in that dreadful 50s of unhappiness. But anyway, difficult you might think to get really, really lost in today's Google mapped and GPS world. But it is actually still possible. Happened to me once in the Gobi Desert with naught but a tin of chocolate covered macadamia nuts from Fortnum and Mason to sustain me before deliverance <laughs> arrived. <cabinet>. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's the kind of story that might be I celebrated. Have no idea where I am this morning now. I'm so completely lost. <laughs> <laughs> It'll all come clear, world. honestly. I'm getting there. Trust me. Trust me. I'm a vicar. It's the kind of story that might be celebrated in the special 40th anniversary edition of Brat's Travel Guides, long the trusted and backpacked companion of serious travellers, in which voyagers from Michael Palin to Matthew Paris describe what happens when things go wrong, sometimes spectacularly. Its editor and publisher is Hilary Brattage is here with us this morning. Good morning, Hilary. Good morning, Richard. Um, it seems not quite right to describe the book as a celebration of irresponsible travel, but actually it is. Well, yes, it is. And I, I should put in um, quickly before my reputation goes entirely that it was a um, response to decades of espousing responsible travel because we're in the forefront about uh, 20, more than 20 years ago, of really telling travellers that they needed to respect the host nation, that they needed to uh, behave in certain ways, that, that travelling isn't just about having your own pleasure, but it's about um, looking after the place that you're going to. It's a hard sell, isn't it, particularly to the intrepid travellers to whom you addressed your work, because actually what people want to do is test the limits of things, discover who they are by putting themselves in strange and unexpected places. I think that's the thing, and actually it did work, and and the media took it up and other publishers took it up. And we actually, I think I've always been a rather irresponsible traveller, so it was probably a bit of an, an effort. Uh, I wanted to tell other people how to behave, but I didn't necessarily want to behave that way myself. That's what I do. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, but, 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 your own tales of irresponsibility, are there any particular adventures you went on where you really thought you were spectacularly irresponsible? I was spectacularly bad. I mean, it goes beyond irresponsible. And, and I do hope this is just between us in this room. Yes, because, this at uh, home. yes, yes <laughs> exactly. Because uh, I might be stripped of my MBE if this uh, becomes public. Uh, before I started writing guidebooks, so therefore I could be irresponsible, I, um, with my then husband, I hired a car in Texas. And uh, we could afford the, ha the car hire charge and we could afford the petrol which was very cheap what we couldn't afford was the additional mileage charge that they put on and the national park that we wanted to go to which was big ben national park was some way away from the town that we hired the car and uh, we drove there we thought my god you know we've already gone 20 or 30 miles we're not going to be able to afford this extra mileage. So we thought, I wonder what happens if we drive backwards, whether the mileometer goes in reverse. <laughs> well, uh, don't try this at home, <laughs> but it does. And Amazing. so on these very empty roads in Big Bend National Park, we Amazing. drove 10 miles forward, 10 miles in reverse, and we did that for 100 miles. I can't Brilliant. think that could have been very good for the car. Brilliant. Oh, it's perfectly good for the car. It's not very good for the driver's <laughs> neck, but, but we, we learned how to do it with wing mirrors and, and the rear mirror. There, there are other forms of irresponsibility. My own one was not checking, making my arrangements properly and finding myself literally stranded in the Gobi Desert for 24 hours with only these chocolate-covered macadamia nuts to keep me going. <laughs> Have you found yourself suddenly, without malice or forethought, finding yourself in the back ends of beyond and not knowing anyone or anything? No, uh, hopeless. I mean, I've got no sense of direction, which I know is a bit of a problem for a guidebook writer, but I do write very nice directions in the book. Um, I suppose one of the irresponsible things was my first trip to Madagascar, and uh, which I love and which I write about quite a lot now. And we wanted to see this uh, reserve, a mountain reserve, with most wonderful wildlife. And uh, we couldn't get permission to go in. In those days, in 1982, <clears throat> uh, no, 1976, there was very little tourist infrastructure. So we headed out on our own, only to be joined by um, a so-called guide, an, an official, but what we didn't know is he hadn't been there before, although he appointed himself as our guide. And there'd been a cyclone, so half the trees in this forest had fallen down across the path, the little path that there was. And to cut a long story short, we were lost for four days in that uh, rainforest, the densest rainforest in Madagascar. 
Um, we ran out of food. We certainly ran out of patience. I did a lot of crying. Uh, we <laughs> followed a river. I mean, the really difficult thing was our lives weren't in very much danger because we always had water. But I actually quite wanted to die because pushing a way through rainforest without a path and without food. I think we had four raisins for a while, but then they went. <laughs> So in the end, we ended up eating roasted weevils, which mm. uh, actually were very nice. Bon appétit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Hilary, this idea of kind of, you know, irresponsible travelling as, as, um, um, as you describe it, I mean, it sounds, it appeals to a lot of people. I think it's very intoxicating. But is there a sense that it's more difficult to do that now in the world that we live in in 2014? Or do you not buy that? I do buy it, actually. I mean, um, I publish guidebooks that make these out-of-the-way places. We specialise in unusual destinations, mm. and we have Sierra Leone, for instance. Um, but uh, we do tell people how to be safe, often by uh, cultural know-how, so you know what's going to insult the local people and what's going to make them feel comfortable towards you. But when I was travelling back in the 70s, um, there were no guidebooks. That's why I started at a guidebook company and uh, it was wonderful because you took a local bus, you got off the bus, you found a hotel, you talked to the local people because you had to because there were no guidebooks and uh, it was the serendipity of that sort of travel was fantastic. There's a very sad story recently about uh, uh, an academic in Moscow who went for a walk in a park and got lost and wasn't discovered and unfortunately died of hypothermia. You can still, uh, adventures and misadventures can happen in most unlikely places and I noticed that you uh, now, Hilary, are investigating and exploring East Devon, which is perhaps not quite as far flung and exotic as Madagascar. But I, I think you can probably have just as much find just as much of interest and surprise doing that. Well, it's much more far flung because I'm actually doing North Devon, which is at least two hours say, drive from where I live. You still might be too hard. <laughs> I'm doing it. It's uh, it's a very happy making book. It's uh, slow travel in North Devon and Exmoor, and indeed, you know, you can you can meet the same interesting people. You can see the same wonderful scenery. You can have the same all encompassing feeling of happiness that you can in in foreign travel. Does this ring your bell, Gary Kemp? Because I know you're a great, you're an infatigable cyclist and indeed pedestrian through England's uh, pleasant means. Yeah, you know, I got introduced to hill walking uh, at grammar school. Uh, economics teacher used to gather us all together and off we'd go to the Lake District. I never, you know, I never really got out of London as a kid apart from South End. Um, and, uh, and I fell in love with the hills. Um, I get what you're saying about how it, it's not as risky now. I, I remember being on a, you know, few times uh, but i remember particularly being in scotland and um you know struggling in the wind with a big uh os map and a compass <laughs> and going down the wrong side of the hill <laughs> and then getting myself in all kinds of trouble in the dark um now we've got gps and uh, that's kind of slightly taken the, it's not as much the, fun the fun out of things <laughs> but i like i like feeling humbled by the environment i love the idea you know in a modern world we can be in a place that is you know, go, thousands of years has looked the same. And uh, that's ex yeah. very exhilarating. And, and also there's moments of surprise. I remember once out on the Mongolian step on a horse with a Mongolian coming across <laughs> out of nowhere a North Korean chip and putt course. <laughs> it was extraordinary. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And there were these Chinese communist <laughs> officials in their suits doing chip and putt into the vastness of the Mongolian <laughs> step. That sort of thing. Is to, you know, and that sort of thing you only discover by wandering into it. Hillary. What were you doing in the Mongolian <laughs> desert well, I, with I crossed, the Mason? Well, well, I did the longest rail journey I could possibly do, which was London to Guangzhou. Well, it was actually London to Hong Kong, but I, it coincided with the collapse of Soviet communism, so it all went a bit pear-shaped, but in a very interesting sort of way. I digress, I digress. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about here is, do you, do, does the real traveller always look for terra nova, new lands to conquer, or is there also something about returning to a place you know well and love and get to know better? I love returning to Madagascar. Mm. Um, I think, I, I think actually I'll pick you up on the real traveller thing because there's been an awful lot of snobbishness about the difference between tourists and travellers. And I used to buy that. I was a real traveller, you know, I went to these uh, new places. But actually I've been guiding tours for, for many years and often it's the regular tourists who are seeing more, experiencing more and getting more out of a trip than the 
intrepid backpackers who sometimes have quite tunnel vision. So, you know, I realised that travel actually can broaden the mind for everyone. What are we meant to think about people who travel to to countries that have um, terrible human rights situations? And uh, and, and should we be promoting that or or even putting money into that country? That's a big question. We published a guide to Burma when you weren't supposed to publish guides to Burma. But I believe, and this isn't necessarily everyone's belief, that actually any sort of human interaction in these countries is more valuable than the not going, because you're not actually usually supporting the government as much as buying handicrafts from local people, maybe staying in local mm. hotels. Uh, and you should, yeah, you should yeah, stay I, in the local hotels, support the local economy. To, to, I totally <clears throat> agree with that, because even in the, 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 the charity work we do with uh, my organisation, Three Lines, what we find out is that people ask us, well, why are you working with countries such as Russia and Gambia? Mm. But you find out that if you draw away from these countries, then what you're creating is a system where people become stereotypical and they don't want to go to these countries and they don't create the human interactions. Forget the politics, the people on the ground level. Let's interact. Yes, I exactly. agree with you on that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we, we did the first guidebook to South Africa before uh, the dismantlement of apartheid. Um, and we did the first very successful one afterwards. And people said, how can you live and work in South Africa? But we were working with non-whites, in quotes. And I mean, I was. And actually, it was one of the most rewarding things I did because I got to know real South Africans. And had I boycotted the country, I wouldn't have learned half as much about yeah. the country. Yeah.